So a very warm welcome to our panel on the future of the green market economy. Well, we uh, have about an hour and 15 to discuss um, whether the state in particular um, has all the capacity it needs, has all the tool it needs uh, to make a green market economy happen and what the interface of, of state and market is. Um, just to start, a few housekeeping notes. So first of all, um, we are very grateful to the German Center for Research and Innovation um, that they've made this panel possible. Secondly, on procedure, we will start with introductions of the speakers and then a one round of questions by me. Um, and then we have actually half an hour reserved uh, for Q and A. Um, so feel free to already start uh, dropping your questions um, in the Q&A function, um, which you can all hopefully find in your Zoom. Um, we'll try and, and get um, as many of those questions answered as possible. Um, I hope all our speakers are already here. Maybe in that case, you could switch your cameras on. So let me start with introducing um, our great panel. First of all, there's Professor Linda Bilms um, from the Harvard Kennedy School. She's an expert on budget and public finance, a former assistant secretary and chief financial officer of the US Department of Commerce, um, an author of multiple books ranging a um, vast array of topics, including the cost of war, veterans issues, national parks, municipal budgeting, um, and further financial topics. So lots to to discuss there. We've also published um, in, in lots of newspapers um, and you're a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. Um, you actually studied at Harvard, if I got that right, um, and have a DPhil from the University of Oxford. Very excited to have you. Um, secondly, we have uh, Mr. Elliot Harris, um, Assistant Secretary General for Economic Development and Chief Economist um, in the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Um, Mr. Elliot Harris is an expert in macroeconomic policies uh, for poverty reduction and for resilient and sustained economic development. Um, in particular, if I understood it correctly in your work, you've been focusing on macroeconomic linkages um, with global and social environmental issues. So taking a bit of a broader picture, um, very well fitting for this discussion. Um, prior to the UN, um, you were at the IMF, the Africa Department, Fiscal Affairs Department, Strategy and Policy Review. Um, so also a bit of the, of the financial side. Um, you actually studied German um, and political science and economics. Uh, which makes it particularly interesting to, to have you here. And you have an advanced study certificate from, from uh, the Institute of World Economics in Kiel. Um, so, yeah, fantastic to, to have you here. I hope we can discuss the international dimension a little bit. Um, and finally, we have Dr. Daniel Bayas, uh, the finance minister of uh, the state of Baden-Württemberg, um, which you've been now for about half a year, I think. Um, and before that, um, you were a member of parliament um, for the Green Party um, since 2017. Um, in that context, you served on the Finance and Budget Committee um, and were one of the chairman of the Wirecard investigation that probably many people here have heard of. You've also chaired the Economic Advisory Council of the Green Party's parliamentary group in the Bundestag. So. Um, again, someone with deep expertise in the finance area. And in your prior life, you're a BCG consultant um, focusing on banking and public sector. And you have a PhD um, you did on, on private equity and did a Fulbright at Cornell in New York. So again, transatlantic perspective. Um, I'm uh, Philippa Siegel-Gleckner. Um, I run a macroeconomic think tank called uh, Dezernat Zukunft based in Berlin. Um, so let me start with with the first round of questions. Um, Danielle, um, I was keen now that, you know, to hear that, that you've been in, in your position as finance minister for a couple of months um, and you are a Green Party member. So obviously that green agenda is probably very important to you. Would you say that as, as government, you really have the tools in place um, to guide a transformation to a green 
market economy. First of all, thank you, Philippa, uh, for the nice introduction. And thank you for having me. Harry. Hi to everyone from uh, Germany. As, as uh, Philippa mentioned already, it's uh, in the evening. So um, I think it's, what, 2 p.m. Uh, across the Atlantic and Boston and elsewhere. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, regarding your question, Philippa, I think we have, we have the tools. I think we have the capital. And I think we have the, the, the technologies uh, that we need, but we need to speed up and we need to speed up massively uh, because global warming reaches a point of no return. And if we really want to be serious about meeting the Paris Agreement, we need quick political, legislative, but also economic um, actions. And um, when I talk to investors, when I talk to companies, they realize that climate change really Uh, is an essential economic um, uh, risk. And there was a study actually quite interestingly two days ago published um, in the German context from the BDE, which is the Association of the German Businesses. And they say, if, if we want to really meet uh, our climate targets by the year of 2030, which is in 10 years, which is basically tomorrow, we need the investments of um, Uh, almost 900 billion uh, euros for Germany. So this is private capital and this is a, a, a public uh, a capital. And this is also part of the problem because um, we have the debt break in Germany. Philippa, you know, you know a lot about that. And I, I, I don't think it's only a question of, of public investments, but just for an example, I introduced the budget for the state of Baden-Württemberg, which is sort of the economic powerhouse of Germany in the next week. It's a budget of 56 billion euros. I think we do uh, we, we do some really good things uh, there when it comes to greening up the, 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 the market economy about green investments and in infrastructure in uh, R&D and, and so on. But I think if we really want to be serious about meeting these targets, we need to be more ambitious, more ambitious on the regional level, more ambitious on the federal level, and also more ambitious on the on the European and the, and the global scale. And I think we need them. Um, And we need to better understand that especially corporates are a very important partner when we are serious about transforming an, an industry-heavy country like Germany into a, a net zero climate neutral uh, um, uh, industry. So getting back to Baden-Württemberg, as I said, it's the economic powerhouse. We are strong in the automotive section. It's the home of Daimler and Porsche and so on. We are strong in the chemistry and machinery and so on. And this brings me to the other part of the question, how do we really mobilize private capital in order to really get through with all the technologies, innovations that we really need um, by uh, meeting uh, the climate target. So summing up, I think there is three levers that we really need and, and, and need to speed up. One is really ambitious climate goals and on the medium, but also on a long-term uh, path. Uh, second, it's carbon pricing, and this is something that we will really negotiate for the upcoming uh, German government. What is the right price and how is the path going forward really to uh, use these market me mechanisms? And third, we need investments, private and public. And um, this is really, uh, I, think, I think, big, and this is really where the discussion is currently going in, in, in Germany. Thank you. I mean, when you say we, we need to speed up, then one of the things I'm starting to think about, well, you know, how does that all work, especially given <laughs> our very long and protracted and detailed public budget cycles? Because, I mean, I don't know the US situation so well, but in Germany, you know, we do a kind of five year planning and then we do budget plan for one year, but you can't really change anything there once you've you know, started to put money in certain boxes. So this whole idea of being fast, being nimble, you know, transforming a system as quickly as possible actually kind of seems to um, be a little bit uh, stand in contrast with, with how, how, how uh, our money allocation in government works. So, Linda, one thing I'd be very curious about, um, what kind of, you know, budgeting processes, what kind of accounting tools do we need to actually make the transformation happening um, at the depth? and the speed that we do need. Okay, uh, thank you, um, Philip, uh, so much and the organizers of this conference uh, for pulling this together. So I think that 
uh, about a, a million behavioral economic studies all reach the same conclusion that in order to get something to happen, you need to make it both easy and advantageous. So in this case, we need to make it as easy and advantageous to track environmental resources and impacts as it is to track revenues and uh, costs. And I think that despite the incredibly good work of the SEA um, at the UN and other organizations, we're still quite a long way from having that kind of easy, advantageous paradigm in which to do these things. So this is a very long list, but, but just to mention a few areas where um, we, we really don't have the mechanisms. Uh, first of all, in most budgeting is done on a very short-term basis. So for example, in the United States, everything the Congressional Budget Office does is um, measured within a 10-year time frame at the absolute maximum. So whether you're studying war costs, which tend to show up 50 years later, or certainly environmental consequences, I mean, the, 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 there, there literally is not the budgetary mechanism to measure that. I mean, secondly, in terms of the mindset, I think that the way um, most budgets and most um, uh, in most countries are, are conceived of is very uh, stovepiped. So the conception is of a sort of pie chart where there's housing and education and environment and, and school lunches and the military, that's a big slice. But you, you know, there's just, it's, it, it's a pie chart mentality. And what we need is an entire mindset shift along the lines of what um, Danielle was saying. Uh, a mindset shift in which, um, in the way the UN has has showed this, in which the economy exists inside of the environment, where where you know the economy should be a subset of the environment, and we have a completely different mindset shift. Now, this translates in many ways, but just as an example, on my ten years serving on the National Parks Board, uh, the way the National Parks measures its own value, and they have fantastic. Uh, uh, group of economists and whatever is purely based around the touristic value of the jobs created at the restaurants and the hotels and everything. The actual value, whether it's ecosystem values in terms of protecting uh, botanical and, and animal species, the, the values of um, the carbon sequestration in the parks, the values of the social um, and cultural protection and historical protection, or even valuing the willingness to pay among people gives the National Parks a valuation that is, is up to a 30 times multiple of the touristic value. So we just like don't have that mindset. Um, the third area where I think we really just don't have the mechanisms yet, we may have some of the technical mechanisms, is, is around the institutional structures around implementing the kind of natural capital accounting that needs to make these um, resources and impacts visible and easy to act upon. And this is in large uh, degree because in most decentralized countries, in Canada, in India, in the, in the US, in, 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 in Russia, in Brazil, um, as well as to some extent in um, Germany, the the um, local governments, the local and regional governments are, are much, much more dynamic and more nimble than the federal governments, which are much more politicized and much more um, lagging. But the fragmentation in many countries of the decision making to actually do anything is, is enormous. And this is a huge institutional barrier. I mean, in Massachusetts, where I'm speaking from right now, there were 350 different local medical uh, jurisdictions in charge of the COVID vaccine, just in the little state of Massachusetts. And that's the same 350 jurisdictions that decide on environmental policies. I mean, this kind of fragmentation means that um, there is not the capacity in many of them to actually do the tracking, use the tools and act on it. Um, and there is um, ecosystems do not graft easily on top of these decision-making units. So the, uh, as I say to my students, the, the mountain lion doesn't know when he's crossing from one jurisdiction to the next jurisdiction or from the national parks to the national forest. But the national parks are in the interior department and the national forests are in the agriculture department. 
know, you sort of magnify this across every single system. And even with some of the technical capacities um, and, and tools that are being developed that we have these institutional barriers. I mean, I'm gonna stop now, there are more um, things to say, but so sort of in short, in order to make it easy, we need not only the accounting mechanisms, but we need a, uh, a mindset shift. We need a um, short-term, long-term shift in the way we do accounting uh, and budgeting. We need uh, a, 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 um, a way to marry up the institutional structure and the fragmentation of decision-making with the need, and we need the, to develop capacity to do this. So all of those things are, um, are, are really urgent if, if we are to, to even have a hope of implementing the kind of tools that are being developed. And now that's already a pretty big challenge in countries like the US and in Germany. Um, but I think when we think about developing countries, um, it's a challenge on probably quite a different scale sometimes. Um, so Elliot, a question to you. Um, what does the international community need to do to support developing countries in the green transition? Is it business as usual? Is it just a bit more technical assistance and um, helping institutions to, to do this? Or does it need to be a complete paradigm change in, in how they act? You know, I've been doing this now for almost two years. You'd think I'd know how to do it. But I guess we all embarrass ourselves continuously and create a community. Okay. Um, look, I'm, I'm going to challenge what I think is sort of behind that question, uh, which is that somehow it is a responsibility of the more advanced economies of the global community to bring to the attention of these developing countries something that should be recognized by any citizen of these developing countries as being in their interest. I do think that if we if we talk about uh, what sort of support is needed to encourage decarbonization, that one can use the examples of the advanced economies that have already made certain steps in progress towards decarbonization, put that out there as a frame of reference. But for me, I think the, the decarbonization is something that can actually be driven in large part by markets framed by the right kind of policy. There is absolutely no need for partners from outside to come in with resources, aid in that sense, or even to a certain extent technical assistance to get that done. Let me, let me explain what I mean. To decarbonize, we're going to have to go into newer technologies. We have to be able to generate energy from renewable and clean sources. And the thing is, we know how to do it. The technologies are well established. They're there. And their market case is already made yeah? everywhere. They are much more scalable, these technologies, uh, be it uh, solar panels or uh, small-scale wind or even small-scale hydrogen, um, hydrological uh, energy generation, they're much more scalable than fossil fuel in every context. And this makes it, in many cases, much more suitable as a, an energy solution for smaller economies. The initial investment that you need to make to get the energy going is much smaller than what it would take to build a coal-fired power plant, for example. Economically, it doesn't make any sense to still go ahead and envisage coal as a source of energy for any developing country, for any economy whatsoever. It makes no economic sense. In addition, we have the possibility of small-scale power generation, mini-grids, decentralized energy generation, all of which make them far more suitable for developing countries that may lack the energy transmission infrastructure that the, uh, the um, advanced economies may have. And so when you look at it there, we have technologies that are well-established. We have um, technologies that are competitive on cost terms with the fossil fuel-based energy generation, the issue boils down to finding the right kinds of financing solutions. Hmm? But then again, when we consider that because of the scalability of these new technologies, well, they're not even new anymore, these are renewable alternative energy um, technologies, it may very well be that the financing constraints are not as binding as we tend to imagine. Hmm? It makes sense on the market basis, it makes sense on the financing basis. We just have to sit down and go through, I think, in, in sort of realistic terms, what we need to bring together to make these solutions happen. Now, one of the things that we need 
are the appropriate policies and regulations. I, I remain convinced that a sustainable market economy must be categorized by policies that do not encourage unsustainable activities. We, we cannot possibly achieve sustainable uh, market practices if it is still profitable to behave in an unsustainable manner. If it is possible to generate a healthy return on an investment in coal, well, unfortunately, people will still invest in coal. And so that is the first step, I think, is that we have to look for ways in which we can make policies, the policy framework overall, consistent, align it with the objectives that we want to achieve. And I think there's a lot that can be done there. And not just in developing countries, by the way, because the largest subsidies of fossil fuels happen not in developing countries. They happen in the rich, advanced, industrialized economies who should know better. Now, we can think about uh, all of these types of things, but there are also other things that the developed economies have done that have made it possible 30 years ago for uh, renewable energies to sort of get a foothold. One of the things that I like to think about is, is the, the feed-in tariff uh, approach that was taken, uh, including in Germany, uh, two decades ago, which made it economically feasible uh, to generate uh, renewable energy on a small scale because you could feed in the surplus energy generated into the existing grid and be compensated for it. These were important little innovations in what is essentially a regulation that made it possible to even the playing field between renewable energies and the existing fossil fuel energies. And once that happened and people started that investment and the market case became clear, the scale of the investments drove the unit costs down to the point now where uh, renewable energy is comparable to coal or even more favorable than coal. And that aligns all of the economic incentives. And if you support those by the right kinds of policy incentives and, and regulatory incentives, then you can start a process by which uh, the decarbonized economy is the economy that actually makes economic sense. And once we get to that stage, then we take away the incentive to do the unsustainable things. Now, all of that doesn't really require a whole lot of aid. It doesn't require any aid at all, if you ask me. But some policy guidance, some exchange of experience, what has worked in countries that are perhaps a little bit more advanced in implementing, introducing and implementing renewable energy solutions, that I think is, is what we can do to support the developing countries to make the transition. I'll stop there. That's very interesting. I have a follow-up question on this for Danielle, but before that, I want to encourage everybody, now is your time, go and ask some questions um, and we'll try and put them to the speakers. Uh, Danielle, since Elliot talked so much about the energy transition in Germany um, and, and looked at that quite positively, do you share that assessment? Yes, I think this, this is a right assessment and a correct analysis. And as Elliot po pointed out, I mean, the, the greatest invention in, in these terms was like 20 years ago when we introduced that we, but the, the uh, red green government back in the days, 20 years ago, uh, the feed in tariff. Uh, which led to the uh, situation uh, that these subsidies created a new technology, new innovations, and a new industry. A lot of uh, a lot of jobs really are in the, in these industry. Solar, wind, by today, by today, far more than they are in coal. And still, we are really having a, are having hard discussions with unions and with corporates uh, because we want to. We are dropping out of coal. The current date is the year of 2038. Maybe the new government um, will uh, make another decision about 2030, 2033 or something like that. But if we look at the global map, I just read in a, in a German newspaper that 75% of the coal plants that are currently planned or, or being built across the globe are in four countries, which is uh, China, India, uh, Vietnam, and a fourth country, I, somewhere also uh, in the East, I, I, I just can't remember, but these four countries by itself stand for 75%. And this is really uh, something that really gives me the impression, what, what, what can we do in Germany and what is, the, is, what is the global scale? And still, and I really much agree with, with that, what Elliot said, I think especially rich countries have a special responsibility because if we show 
that there is a business case, I'm convinced that uh, others will follow. Just to give you one example, um, five, six, seven years ago, my prime minister, my, my boss, so to say, uh, Winfried Kretschmann, he was annoyed that the German government, but also other governments across the globe are not speeding up enough uh, in, the, in the energy transition question. So he went to California and he signed a contract with uh, the governor, former governor Jerry Brown, a memorandum of understanding for a, um, uh, for a, for a contract that really want to keep the one, the two degree uh, 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 goal and take, it, and take it serious. And by now, I think other 130 regions have really joined this. But giving a signature is one thing. Really implement these policies. These are this is this is the other thing. And then we I, I we need to be uh, we need also also show to uh, to some degree some self criticism. If I look at my state, the state of Baden Württemberg, as I said, e economic powerhouse, we need a lot of energy, and we are not so we 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 are, we are not there where we should be when it comes to solar, when it comes to wind. This has. S several uh, issues. Uh, some of them is bureaucracy. If you uh, start working on a wind farm, uh, on, a, on a windmill by today, the moment re where it really is in place is like six years from now, six years. Yeah, this is the, this is the time slot that we talk about. Or just to give an another impression, yeah, solar panels. We have so many uh, possibilities really because we are down south in Germany to really use solar power more than we are today. So we have introduced a bill that if you build a new house, public or private, no matter, you really, you are obliged to, you need to put a solar panel on your roof, so to say. Is this a free market economy? No, not really. But I think it's a, it's a green market economy. Yeah? This is what we call Ordnungspolitik. Yeah? It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a policy um, as the introduction of the feed-in tariff that Elliot mentioned like 20 years ago to give an incentive uh, to people to really um, also use their possibilities and tools um, uh, to speed up um, renewable energies. And of course, we are not supposed to forget about the financing side. We need the public investment tools like the KfW, which is the uh, uh, German, um, how do you say, Philippa, the German um, uh, public public bank. The public bank, exactly. The and we have bank. the same. We have the same uh, bank on on a regional level, the, the Landesbank in Baden-Württemberg, that they really give um, um, interest-free uh, adapt uh, to private people in order um, um, to speed up um, on, on on solar and, and wind project. And let me get to one 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 other point I think which is important, and and I think the the, the pandemic has shown that we were able to invent and distribute a um, COVID vaccination in less than 12 months, which is really incredible. Uh, one of the companies that were successful is BioNTech, a company not far from, uh, from, from, from my place in uh, Germany. Of course, there, there were billions of euros in, in, the, in, the, in, 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 the, in this company, high risk uh, capital. But I think it's, it's, it's fascinating to see what capital markets are able to deliver. But when it comes to the climate topic, it's not that the just vaccination that we need. We need technologies and innovations in basically all the sectors, chemistry, machinery, steel. And this is a question of capital, but I think it's also a question of very specific poli policies in these certain fields and industry sectors. And this is something where really um, good policies, good policy making, and the right incentives to mobilize cap capital in the fields of R and D by tax benefits or by um, really policies uh, like the um, mentioned solar obligation that we've now uh, started in Baden-Württemberg um, um, to mobilize the capital to really speed up on on, on this topic. Thank you. You said something really interesting, mentioning the COVID crisis. So. In the case where we have an immediate crisis that is really visible, that you know has really visible pain, somehow it seems to work. I mean, the state seems to be able to to do a lot, to achieve a lot in a very short period of time. Um, now, the problem with climate seems to be a little bit. Um, it's a huge problem, um, but the consequences are not always that immediately visible. Um, only you know when you have floods or droughts, but it's not there every day. Um, 
Now we have a fairly unique opportunity of having an expert in war costs here. And I assume that problem is somehow a little bit similar because you have these huge deferred costs that only become visible at the later stage in time, but are very significant. So I was wondering, Linda, are there any parallels and is there anything we can learn from how we deal with the costs of war and how we talk about that um, for climate and how we bring that that realization kind of forward and don't wait too long? Well, I mean, that's a very interesting question, Philippa. And I must say, I've never been asked that particular question before. So thank you very much. Um, but when Joe Stiglitz and my longtime um, co, um, co-author and I started studying the cost of war from the, you know, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars in 2004, I mean, we never expected that all these years later, we would still be the only ones really tracking uh, the costs of these wars. And we discovered, among other things, how little war costs are tracked, that there's no really accepted framework, that nobody is really tracking the costs of the wars, in particular, the long-term costs, for example, of um, caring for veterans of wars. So just as an example, the, uh, these, these, these costs happen over a long period of time. The, the peak year for paying for veterans from World War I was in 1969, more than 50 years after armistice. And the peak year for paying for veterans from World War II was in 1986. So, I mean, these things are a long time um, coming and there's no um, sort of mechanism for, for really studying and tracking these costs. Now, um, the only place where these things, where, um, I, I mean, I, there is a, a sort of parallel in that the fact that the failure to really track and understand the long-term costs of war, uh, I, in my opinion, makes it easier to go into war, easier to prolong war, and easier to go to war again. Now here, the the failure and the lack of a really easy framework for studying the costs uh, of environmental damage, particularly the lack of metrics and measures to to measure and understand biodiversity impacts, which which is in its infancy compared with being able to measure emissions and and greenhouse emissions, the the complete lack of of, um, an accepted accounting framework for measuring uh, stocks and flows of biodiversity assets. I mean, that, that is similar in that we are, you know, heading for disaster and continually sort of reinventing the flat tire um, by, by not measuring and recognizing the damage and costs. But um, I mean, there are a lot of things I could say here, but one of the ways in which we can, with modest changes in our accounting system, that we can make a huge difference in our ability and in the forcing mechanism of forcing every single organization that produces an income statement and files um, accounting statements to recognize the um, amount and condition of their environmental assets and the, 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 is to change the accounting systems. Now, the, the UN has put forward a, um, the, the uh, system of environmental economic accounting, which is a pretty good system. The World Bank also has some, some systems. The, the um, Paulson Institute and the Dasgupta report recently have all kind of given more, more strength to this. But what it basically means is that right, right now, the way the system works, it, you know, if you are doing everything right and you're a business or you're a hospital or, or a government, is that you produce um, income statements, balance sheets, other financial statements. And if, if you have an asset, an environmental asset like land that you ruin, say, through oil and gas um, exploration, you can then depreciate that asset and then it sort of goes away. It doesn't become a long-term liability. And uh, conversely, the, the value of maintaining that land and the ecosystem services that it produces in good condition are not listed as assets. So all the incentives are sort of backwards. And for this reason, for example, 
in the United States, there are 430,000 sites, not counting Alaska, just in the lower states, uh, 430,000 uh, sites of um, oil and gas lands that have been explored, drilled in, and left derelict that are just sitting fallow on balance sheets of companies around the United States. Now, this represents 2 million acres, which in German terms is the same amount as all of the forests that are protected in Germany. So this is a huge amount, and this would not be possible with simple uh, accounting changes to the international Gasby system, which would provide an incentive, shift the incentive structure. And I totally agree with um, Elliot on the fact that the private sector is absolutely critical to this and the private sector has to, I mean, they have to produce these statements. And this is a sort of simple way of introducing into the existing system a mechanism for tracking the amount and the condition and the value of ecosystem services. And there are now fairly um, fast track ways to track this ge geographically as well as um, financially, but without making these changes, it just won't happen. Those 430,000 derelict oil and gas sites are just gonna sit there as, as zeros on the balance sheet, not on the plus or the minus column. Thank you. Switching topic a little bit, um, there's a question from the audience uh, to Elliot, um, where people, I guess, are a bit more skeptical that the market can solve everything, given um, the geopolitical tensions that we see at the moment. So the question is, given the increased uh, tensions between the West and China, can climate change be solved by markets alone, or do we need a very active role for international cooperation um, to get decarbonization done? Where are the geopolitical tensions existing? They're between the governments of China and the US, not between the private sectors. No, look, I, I'm sorry to, to, to laugh at this. I, I think that the, the role here is for um, governments to set the stage, to set the kinds of policies that are clearly and predictably committed to reaching the Paris Agreement, to reaching the Sustainable Development Goals, to providing, achieving the climate objectives. All right. Now, if the policy is clear and well set and predictable, then it sets a very clear framework for private sector activity. Because, I mean, I'll give you a clear example, and this is something that really struck me when I heard about it. Um, the country of Ecuador, in the course of 15 years, moved from a, sorry, not Ecuador, Uruguay, moved from a, um, an energy mix of 94% fossil fuel to an energy mix of 94% renewable without a single penny of government investment. What it took was an energy law that very clearly stated that this was the direction of policy. And it was a law that was adopted not only by the ruling party or by the parliament of the day, but by all of the political parties of the country. This was a national energy policy. And that set a very clear signpost for the private sector. In a foreseeable period of time, policies were going to change to make it difficult to make money with fossil fuel energy. And so they started funneling their investments instead of into fossil fuels, into the renewables. Now, of course, that all sounds very simple and so on. Uruguay is a small country. It's easily, um, these things are easily discussed. But the principle is that the private sector will react to the incentives that are set. It's always been that way. It always will be that way. If you set the wrong incentives, you get the wrong results. And so that I think is the first and most primordial role of policy is to make it clear that the commitment to the climate objectives or to the sustainable development objectives or to the equality objectives or to gender empowerment objectives, that all of these commitments are firm and that the policy will be consistently implemented in support of those commitments. That then becomes a clear element in the planning of the private sector. And a private investor who, despite the clear signal that the policy is going against fossil fuels, who goes ahead to invest in fossil fuel, runs the risk of a stranded asset. They run the risk of making an investment that in a foreseeable period of time is worth nothing, can generate nothing and cannot be sold to anyone else. An investor who does that deserves to lose his money. And I think that that is something that we gov our governments don't realize. It's the real power of government is to set the framework, to set the stage 
for private activity, for social activity, for the, the types of undertakings that together give us sustainable development. It's not that the governments have to do it all, and it's not that the governments have to stand back and let the private sector do whatever it wants. It's a question of setting the stage, framing it the right way. And that is something that I think many governments need to spend more time consulting with their citizenry about. Talk to your citizens. Tell them, this is what we plan to do. This is why we plan to do it. Do you support us in this? When you have that, you can put the policy in place and you can be pretty pretty relaxed that the private sector isn't going to go against what they see is clearly the way, the way of the future. I hope that answers the question. That's how I see it. Um, that's a, in any case, very, very interesting. But one thing that I always ask myself when I hear this, um, especially when we look back at you know, policy making in recent years is um, time frame, because it's very nice when governments set policies or change climate policies, you know, every two years, but that's a bit too short term for especially industrial companies to really react to it. I mean, when I'm a, um, a chemical company, for instance, you know, my time horizon for investments is like 10, 15 years. So if the government changes its policy every two years or you know, there's a fluctuating carbon price or they decide to go step by step, that's really not much, much use for my investment decisions. So, um, Daniela, I was wondering, I mean, you're the finance minister of a very industrious state. You mentioned a couple of the industries that, that play a big role in Baden-Württemberg. Um, have you already had the chance to, to have these conversations with companies of, you know, what the time horizon is they, they need policy certainty over in order to, to be able to do the right investments? Uh, yes, well, because it's part of my job to talk to the industry, because if the industry is doing good, uh, the finance minister is doing good, because <laughs> we really had a, a troubled uh, time in the last 18 months um, um, on, uh, uh, on, uh, uh, on, on, on the spending side, because we were using billions to fight uh, the pandemic and the crisis. And also uh, from the tech space, which basically eroded. Um, so this has really given me a hard time. I, I, ca I can say that I'm actually quite positive regarding to my companies and to my, my industry in my backyard, so to say, because the automotive industry has understood that the markets of the future are green and not because the Green Party says so, but because the countries in the world where we export our products, they introduce e-quotas in China, or if you look to Scandinavian countries or even France and, and the UK, uh, they have understood that the, uh, fossil, uh, the fossil engine is not the business model of the future, so to say. Yeah. And um, just, to give you, just to give you one anecdote, yeah, because um, if, you, if you would have asked some people from Baden-Württemberg who are really proud um, uh, about their car industry 10 years ago, do you think that at a certain point of time, a company like Tesla is building in the east of Germany in Brandenburg a factory, and at the same time, uh, Daimler, who has invested in a Tesla, I think in 2009, and they sold their stake when they went public, um, the, the stake, well, there, well, there was there was some shares but the worth of these shares by today, if they would have kept it, would be more than the public value of the, of the Daimler AG in the in the in the heart of Stuttgart. And this really has showed the, the 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 disruption and the dynamic of transformation. And by now, all the comp the car companies, but also the OEMs, the chemistry, the machinery, they have understood that resource efficiency, energy efficiency a green business model, this is the future. So they invest a lot. And the good thing is a lot of our companies are not listed on stocks, but they are family owned. This is classical Swabian Mittelstand. Mm -hmm. And they don't think in the next quarter, next year, they think in generations. And I think this helps mm -hmm. uh, transforming um, um, uh, 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 their business model. And if I talk to these companies, now getting back to your question, Philippa, I just had a dinner with... Uh, with um, 20 of very famous um, uh, uh, company uh, company CEOs in uh, 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 Baden-Württemberg two or three three days ago, and they say we are really willing to go the way, and we are willing to invest. But what we really need is reliable long-term conditions, so, so that we really can build a business case, and we are not interested in changing policies and changing political. 
uh, ideas every two years or, or so, but we need, need a long-term perspective. And I think Elliot has mentioned it earlier. And I mean, this is easy to understand. We, it, it needs, we, it needs to, there needs to be room for business model. There needs to be a room for business model. Um, if, 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 you, if you're not profitable, you won't, you won't be investing. And give you, maybe give you one last example where, where you really need to uh, see the need of also public investments and subsidies is when it comes to steel. I think really transforming the steel companies to a zero uh, uh, um, 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 carbon industry, we need we need investments on a massive scale. Massive. We have the technologies, but we need really investments on a massive scale. But if you se- if you sell um, green steel, this is twice the price or even more than uh, regular steel. Let's say from coal from from Poland or from China. So what what do you need? Um, there are several um, uh, options on the table. Some argue we need some sort of tariffs, which is also always difficult from a trade perspective. But I think which is more interesting are so-called uh, CFDs, car- uh, um, 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 how, do you, how do you say, carbon... Um, contracts, uh, for contracts for difference. For difference. Exactly, contracts for difference, which are sort of a subsidy, which really gives incentives investing in green steel and make this green steel also profitable. So it, there needs to be a business model. And in order to, be, to establish a business model, it needs long-term reliable um, uh, conditions and on a time scale, uh, Philippa, we talk about at least 10, 15 or 20 years. But because if, if you want to build up an all electric car industry, you need to really, you need to be sure that, that this is it, uh, at least for the next uh, one and a half decades or, 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 even, or even more than that. And I think this is really I- I important to drive this transformation in our companies. Thank you. Uh, Linda, you already brought up that short-termism of, of government, um, and now Danielle has emphasized how much that can be an issue, and one instrument maybe to mitigate is to have carbon contracts for difference, or even if the carbon price maybe changes, companies just have the certainty, um, because it's kind of like an insurance mechanism that they will get paid. Um, but what other instruments are there for governments to you know, even if they are dem- democratically elected and have, you know, limited timeframes of, of some sort, what other instruments are there for governments to to be a bit more long-termist, to maybe even offer something like, I thought that was interesting, someone men- mentioned it to me two days ago, something like forward guidance, something we have in central banking. Central bankers are very conscious about the language and they try and tell markets what is happening in one year, in two years in the medium term. Um, which has, you know, really dramatically removed how much, uh, reduced how much markets fluctuate. So are there additional tools and maybe even, you know, tools of communication, of, of planning, maybe accounting that governments can use in order to get a bit more long-termist and improve that coordination with the private sector? So um, thank you. So that's an interesting question. So I don't, you know, I agree with everything that Danielle said about, the needing to have investments in the you know, steel industries and other you know large industrial areas, um, I think though that in many advanced economies, you know, a huge part of the economy is in the services and small businesses and medium-sized businesses, and and you know across a, a really wide range of projects where where um, the the capacity issues are very very significant, and and so um, I think there are a number of areas where I think the government can do, I I mean, the the Biden administration is trying to, as we all know, you know, to invest in green infrastructure. They're they're having a um, difficult time getting it through Congress, but I think this is going to happen. But but there are a whole range of areas that I think are more, um, are are also acceptable where we could do much, much more. So I'm starting with the training capacity. I mean, there is a shortage of almost every kind of technical worker, you know, from installing solar panels to um, working to, to uh, measuring and, and helping to lower emissions for all kinds of small and medium-sized businesses to assessing um, the carbon footprint of um, many medium-sized businesses and nonprofits and other organizations. I mean, we, we could be forgiving all, tra- I mean, we could be paying for all training in these kind of trades. 
um, as a national capacity building exercise. And we right now have several hundred um, thousand immigrants coming in from the southern border, which has been a you know political issue here. I mean, every single one of those um, individuals coming in could be put into a training program um, for for um, some of these jobs for which there are really, really huge demand and very, very little train capacity. Um, the second area is on really providing data sets, global data sets. And um, the, there are, I mean, right now we have local governments and businesses trying to get their hands on all kinds of data. I mean, so it's easy to say, okay, we're going to track the stocks and flows, but how do you actually do that? And, how, and, and what is the circumference of the area in which you're responsible, which usually doesn't map over whatever jurisdiction you're in. So providing those data sets and making it very, very easy to get them, make them available, make them up to date is another area where the government could really invest and, and really help move uh, the needle. I mean, another area is on the rewards for companies that are taking the lead in this. So when I was at the Commerce Department, we had these Baldridge Quality Awards. Um, which we still have. And companies absolutely kill themselves. This was sort of at the time of, of, you know, total quality management and that kind of thing. I mean, companies absolutely went crazy to try and win these Baldrige Awards. I mean, there could be such a large push in offering rewards in terms of recognition, prestige, and money uh, to companies that are meeting various kinds of milestones, um, which actually are, are not that expensive for the government to provide. But right now, I mean, we, you know, I mean, there, there, there aren't the kind of Nobel prizes for companies in, that are really taking the lead and um, harnessing the natural competitiveness of industry with everybody's appreciation for being appreciated. I mean, there are all of these kind of um, what I might call soft, softer um, investment possibilities where the government can be pushing the needle. So I guess um, where I come out is that we need hard investment, but we also need a huge program of um, what they call nudges, you know, of these, of these softer kind of efforts to promote, reward, celebrate, and, and provide money for training, mentoring, um, providing open source data for all the inputs that are needed and make them easy and accessible, rewards, celebration, and so forth. Thank you. Elliot, you wanted to come in. Yes, in, in fact, I wanted to sort of follow up on something that Daniel said, but it, it links in a little bit to what Linda's talking about, which is um, there's all of this other kind of encouragement that can take place. When we talk about policy and the way in which government can can enable this, can facilitate the transition. We, in the back of our minds, we're thinking about national level policy and national level governments. But if you stop for a minute and you ask yourself, okay, where does the infrastructure that we need for the transition actually get decided upon? It's not at the national level, no, it's down at the local level. And it brings to mind a conversation I had with a very senior executive of one of the largest German automakers. And I'm not gonna say in which Bundesstaat this uh, automaker is located out of sensitivity for my fellow panelist. Um, and she was telling me that, you know, they have decided that they are only going to be producing electric, well, no more internal combustion engines by a certain date. And she had a very significant problem. She said, in the United States where you live, when we sell our cars, the people who are our clients generally live in single family homes, which means that they can charge their, their electric vehicles much more easily at home with a little bit of a charger that you install. And the problem is that most of her German clients live in cities, not in single family homes, but in, in apartment buildings. So the question of the charging infrastructure becomes an issue. She says that is something that they are in discussion with the municipal authorities in three or four of the major German cities with to see, well, what are the options? How can the municipality help to provide the electric vehicle charging infrastructure, which would then enable a much more rapid transition towards the use of electric vehicles. That has nothing to do with national level policy, but it does have everything to do with the investment decisions, infrastructure investment decisions of the municipal authorities. And, and those are the types of, 
of changes that have to happen, I think, in the policy framework, in the in the investment decision frameworks of, uh, as the Germans would say, the öffentliche Hand. That is where the enablement of the necessary private investments is going to actually happen. And that is true for every single country on the planet. Because the real change happens at the local level, is decided upon by local authorities. And the problem is that these local authorities are not the ones who, st- who talk to the big donors in the developing countries. And they are not the ones that can levy the uh, income taxes that the federal government can levy or the profit taxes or the corporate taxes that are levied. And this is the problem. They, they, need, they are the ones that have to do the infrastructure investments and they are not the ones who can get access to the large scale finance. And when the private investor goes out to talk to the government, they are not going down to the local level, they're going to the national level to speak or, or to the uh, provincial level to speak to the ministers there. And this is something that I think we have to be aware of and figure out how to deal with. Thank you. Daniel, do you want to come in on this? Yes, we get, we, get in the, we get to the core of federalism in Germany, which is one of our strengths, but in some parts, it's also giving us a, a hard time. But no, uh, to be serious, I mean, first of all, this what, what, what Elliot just mentions, I mean, this is, this is absolutely clear, it's right. Um, uh, the municipalities, the, the communities, the cities, this is basically where politics happens. This is the place where citizens also um, really are face to face with their local governments. And this is actually also some of one of the problems because we have an investment deficit of 140 billion euros in Germany in our in our communities. This is um, a fast internet, this is public transportation, this is roads, this is school buildings and so on. And um, so um, this is this is, yeah, as, a, as, as a Elliot points out, one of the problems. But I think because you mentioned the, the, the very specific question, Elliot, of uh, how to charge your electric vehicle, I think the discussion is even more complex. And this is also giving us a hard time in Germany, in the holy land of the, of the car and the automotive industry, because the life reality of people is so different. You mentioned the cities. Yes, a lot of people in the cities live in apartments and smaller apartments. And we have also, I don't want to say a housing crisis, but we have rising housing uh, uh, rents and, uh, in cities like Stuttgart, Munich, Hamburg, and so on. So this is the social aspect. And we have the question of how do we gain more area in these cities? So in Germany, we have, are having really hard discussions, not about let's kick out the cars out of the cities, but how does a modern transportation system in the cities look like and then you you talk to people in the rural area and 70 percent of the people in baden-württemberg will live in rural areas there, there are rural areas and there are very very rural areas yeah where is nothing besides a church and um, maybe um, a, a small um, how to say rathaus a small the mm-hmm. small public building where the mayor where the, where the mayor sits and then um, a few thousand inhabitants and of course the car is i mean this is this is like one of the major um, uh, major instruments for these people to bring their uh, kids to school uh, to uh, commute uh, to their uh, workplace and so on so what i was going to say is that different municipalities different communities different cities have very different Uh, challenges they are facing and the companies now have to adapt to these challenges because they say okay i bet that people who live in rural areas they will buy cars in the future as well and we need to we need to become better uh, from um, uh, uh, when it comes to distance uh, from from the for the electric vehicles and we have different um, um, yes Uh, realities in the cities where people tend more using public transportation or are using cars but they more are using renting um, uh, models yeah, or uh, sharing models and so they say and this is also one of the challenges for the for the companies and i think this makes it a little bit trickier for them to figure out where is the trend uh, going because you don't have this very homogeneous market as it used to be um, in the in the past or in the present uh. Um, Danielle, let me come in with two 
maybe tricky questions from the audience. Um, do we need to ban short haul flights or do we just need to set the right incentives for our economy and work with cap and trade? No, we don't need to ban them. Yeah? Um, I mean, there are, there are really crazy connections within Germany. I think there was a flight from, Nuremberg, from the city of Nuremberg uh, to Munich, which is like, an, I think, a two-hour uh, ride with the train. This doesn't make absolute sense. But I think the best answer you can give is really to invest in high-speed train systems. And we have a very good high-speed train system in Germany, but it's not, uh, it, it's, not, it's not all over the country. Just to give you one example, there was a train connection between the two big cities. And I, I, I guess Philippa is taking this train a lot between Berlin and the city of Munich. I, I, I take this train a lot myself. Um, and back in the days, this was like a six and a half hour ride. And then there was massive investments in the in the in the railroad track, and by now it's uh, less than uh, four hours. Yeah, um, and if you take the plane, uh, you have to go out an hour out of the city of Munich, and then you need an hour for the uh, plane ride itself, and then you're uh, landing in the new uh, new airport in Berlin, and you need another another hour to get back into the city, and this doesn't make any sense anymore. And the um, the traffic from Lufthansa has shown since the new introduction of this railroad track, the um, the the numbers of flights was reduced by 50%, fifty percent, five zero. So it has been halved. What, what, why I'm saying this? I'm saying this. If you give an alternative to people, which is more convenient, I think this is something that uh, Linda mentioned in, in one of her first statements. It has to be um, convenient and it has to be affordable. And it, as long as you have flights for 30 euros, because the carbon pricing and the pricing of the taxation um, of gasoline for, for planes is not um, uh, within the pricing, then you have these absurd uh, market mechanisms and pricing. But you have, if you have convenient and affordable uh, alternatives on the one side, and you have rising prices for the dirty alternative, let me put it in this uh, uh, field, I think then really people will start switching um, to these uh, uh, more convenient and uh, uh, public transportation, uh, transportation systems. And then there's another question. Of course, we need long uh, distance flights in the future within Europe, but also across the transatlantic, because I think all of us know after a pandemic of one and a half years, personal contact is important, especially in very political times. And I'm very positive that uh, with the new uh, administration in the US, the uh, cooperation between Europe and Germany um, um, in, in specifics uh, with the United States will improve. So we need more personal um, uh, uh, cooperation and, and, and meetings. Um, and so, and, and still, this is probably the hardest part of it because Philippa asked me with the first question, do we have all the tools and the techniques and the innovations in the fields of aviation? We are not, we are not there yet. If, if I talk to Boeing, to Airbus, if I talk, because I'm on the advisory board of the um, 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 airport of Stuttgart, which belongs partly to the government of, of, of Baden-Württemberg, I mean, of course, they are, they are really... Yeah, uh, uh, pulling their, br their brain on this and they are um, investing in, in, in R&D. But this is part of the formula where we need really some brilliant and smart ideas within the next 15, 15 years or so. And, um, and this is also one of, the, one of the true answers that we have to give when it comes to this. But I think because, because uh, Philippa, you, you, you said the word prohibitions, I mean, this is sort of an, an, an it has become a, a, a dangerous word in Germany. But from my perspective, prohibitions and policies, this is a basic set of tools in a market economy. Um, um, I mean, a, a, a children's work has been prohibited yeah, for good reasons, uh, just to make it very uh, clear and simple, for very good reasons. And maybe they come up other reasons to prohibit certain things or behaviors or technologies. I think it has to be balanced. But of course, if we come to a point of time where you see there are new innovations that don't solve any problems, but cause, uh, are causing new problems, Bitcoins maybe, just to give you one completely different example, maybe 
this is something I would say, okay, let's have the discussion. Is this something that really is progress to society? And if we say yes, okay, then we need a set of rules. And if we say no, then we say, okay, let's prohibit something. I mean, this is um, a regular course of discussions uh, uh, about, about policies. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not afraid of using the word prohibitions. I think this is just a very plain political discussions we need to uh, conduct in very specific fields and, and, and questions. Thank you. Quick follow-up on, on policy, uh, Daniel. Is there a need for Germany to reconsider the nuclear energy exit? Oh, this is, a, this is a good one. This is a good one. I mean, this discussion comes and goes and we can discuss a lot. Um, was it smart um, to drop out of nuclear and now drop out of coal? Shouldn't have been the other way around? Maybe, yeah, in the Green Party, this, brought this, this topics is very special, but also within German society. The, the question of nuclear energy is very special. I just want to remind, because I read this in the newspaper all the time, nuclear energy is not carbon free. It's, it's not as bad as coal, but it ha it's emitting carbon, uh, of course. And there is the question of what do we do with the nuclear waste? In my, in my former constituency, when I was a parliamentarian, we had a, a nuclear power plant. Um, we dropped out of it and now we are really, um, yeah, Uh, 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 building it down and we have to figure out what, what are we doing with the waste for the next hundred years or so. I mean, to give you a clear answer, I think this, this, is, this is not a question that is really seriously debated in Germany because it's not a question of do we need new bridging technologies? There is the question is how do we massively scale up a renewable energies? If there is one, Uh, bridging a technology, then it's gas. I'm on the supervisory board of one of uh, Germany's largest um, um, uh, energy companies, ENBW, um, because it's part, partly uh, owned by the, by the government of Baden-Württemberg. We are um, reinvesting in some gas, um, um, in some uh, gas factories and gas uh, uh, plants. But this is a bridging uh, technology. On the other hand, we are massively investing in solar power and in um, uh, offshore energy. And I think this is the way to go forward. But this is also, Philippa, if I may just say, mention this very quickly, um, other European countries are going other, um, other roads on that. We are having a discussion about the green taxonomy for financial markets. And currently, I think also with respect to the uh, French use of uh, nuclear uh, uh, energy on a, on a, on a large scale, uh, it seems like the European Commission um, um, are um, integrating nuclear energy within their taxonomy as a green investment, so to say. From a green perspective myself, from a German perspective, perspective this, uh, uh, this, is, this is wrong. But of course, we respect that other countries are uh, going different roads. This is not, this is not easy, but um, yes, I mean, um, we all know um, uh, renewables, this is the future and um, this is where we're heading. So I don't think that this is a serious question. Uh, within the German society or uh, within the next German government? Uh, Linda, a question to you from the audience. Uh, we've now taken a lot of time to talk about climate change mitigation, but what about adaptation? How can markets incentivize investments in infrastructure resilience? Or maybe how can governments incentivize investment in infrastructure resilience, I think? Sorry, Philippa. So the question is, how can the government increase incentives well yeah i think so it said how can the market incentivize investments in um infrastructure resilience um but i think normally the government incentivizes and the market reacts to it so i will interpret the question as that well i mean i think The government, in the various ways that I've discussed, can, can always provide incentives. The government can provide seed money. The government can provide matching grants to local, um, local governments, which control in, in the United States and in many countries about 90% of the infrastructure investments and making it really advantageous for local governments to invest in, in um, and support green infrastructure projects is, uh, is very important way that the national governments can can do this but i think 
we have to always bear in mind the fact that we're dealing with um, not only a sort of supply and top down, but a bottom up situation. I mean, local governments are pretty responsive to uh, local parochial concerns. And so we're always dealing with the situation when it's with infrastructure about parochial concerns, about people's demand, whether it's airline flights or, or buses or green buses or, or trams or, or um, charging stations for electric cars or whatever. I mean, they're very, very specific parochial concerns. And in terms of changing the demand side, um, people don't, it, it, is, it is not clear uh, to me that that in I mean, although uh, people understand and every survey shows that even in, in the United States, an overwhelming majority, more than two thirds of the population favors doing more environmental things, doing more climate uh, change related in, uh, investments and so forth. People don't necessarily draw, connect the dots between what that means. So it's not clear that even though somebody says, oh, I support the environment or I support something that is going to be a more climate friendly investment, that they understand that that means that it's going to cause two years of disruption in order to install a new train line between this place and that place or something. I mean, it's not those things are not made necessarily clear to people. So in terms of the messaging and the communication and the the explanations and the simplicity of explaining these things, to um, this is an area where the local governments don't have a lot of experience, but that influences their ability to make the, the right or the more green decisions. Um, in terms of the actual, um, the second thing that governments can do to really in, in, incentivize that, it is expediting some of the, the um, red tape around all of the long, long pr processes around approval for projects, for green projects. So things that are kind of uh, green lighted as a green project should be able to go through a, a sort of an expedited process. And by expediting the process, that means that um, you, will, you will, again, you will nudge, you will create an incentive for things to go through this expedited process. And um, third is expediting and simplifying some of the regulatory frameworks for more green projects. So for example, if the alternative is putting in a concrete seawall, uh, um, a storm surge barrier versus uh, a seawall that is a green seawall that is made out of oyster beds or something, I mean, why should they both have to go through exactly the same process? I mean, the, the, when one is clearly the more green alternative, I mean, right now they have to go through the same exact process of, of um, permitting permitting and so forth. So I think that there are ways that we can at the that we can short of just providing money that we can help. But the key to this is understanding that infrastructure investment decisions are made at the local level. As um, Elliot and Danielle have said and as I pointed out in my opening comments here. So the local level for infrastructure is the decision making unit. The national governments don't make the decisions. Um, and um, another, uh, just one more, more thought that I had um, sort of related to this. So um, one of the things that Danielle was saying about was about the airport in Stuttgart. And one of the real advantages that Germany has in its ability to influence decisions in industry is the fact that in, as my understanding is that in many areas in, of, um, in German regional governments, for example, the, the government of Lower Saxony owns some share of the car manufacturers there. And there are sort of investments in some state ownership of some portion or some shares in some corporations. And for example, Danielle was saying uh, there was a government interest in the airport. The idea of some kind of government ownership provides a way for there to be government input into the overall public good, apart from just the parochial interests of the company. And this is something which has become that the idea of government ownership, as we've shifted over the last sort of 50 years to a, a model of privatization being the, the, the gold standard uh, in order to promote efficiency. This is something that I think we need to think about readjusting again.
because government ownership enables the public good to be brought into the conversations. And without that kind of honest broker of some government ownership, which is not saying government takeovers, but government participation in ownership, I think provides another way for, um, for these concerns to be addressed early on in the process. Awesome. Thank you very much. And it's been a fascinating panel. I want to wrap up with a very, very quick concluding question for each of you, but one sentence uh, response, if you can. What are your expectations for COP26? Elliot. If we could finally get past the fixation on money and start to look at what is actually going on, we would have a much more optimistic perspective. And I hope that that optimism comes out of, of COP26. Awesome. Danielle. I fully agree with uh, what that uh, what Elliot said. Uh, I shared it at uh, optimism regarding that. And um, yes, I just uh, say, I think he you, you said it absolutely correctly. I share it with you. Linda. In the best-selling book, uh, the book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, they talk about the problem that people are always in the urgent box and not in the important box and how you need to think about that. In this case with climate change, we have been in the important box, like this is very important, but not in the urgent box. And I'm hoping that COP26 helps move this into the urgent box. Wonderful. With that, thank you everybody for tuning in um, and have a great rest of the conference. And thank you to all the speakers.